Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Rebecca Connors, and I am one of the co-founders of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary art space focused on community, connection, and continued learning. The Notebooks Collective believes that Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are on the unceded lands of the Kickapoo, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket tribes. In addition, there may be other Native American nations who lived on or traveled through these lands. With events that bring people from all parts of the US, we encourage you to check out this map, which will be placed in the chat, to share where you are located on what lands you are located. Um, we also want to note uh, that we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and against colonization and war in any form. We really hope you enjoy tonight's event. I will now turn things over to Lisa to introduce tonight's lineup. Thanks, Becca. My name is Lisa and I'm the other founder of the Notebooks Collective. One of the things we love is when poets are able to not only read from their work, but discuss the underpinnings, the backstories, and the life that goes into the work. And tonight's reading, well, tonight's reading is really special. These three poets, Jose and Hill Aragus, Quentin Collins, and Daniel B. Summerhill know each other in ways that go deeper than simply reading at the same event. Quentin and Daniel work, workshop together in the Solstice MFA program now at LaSalle University. After graduation, they trusted each other with their works in progress, emailing work back and forth, one on the East Coast, one on the West. And Jose serves on the faculty of the Solstice program where Quentin is now the assistant director. But that's just the easy stuff. The not so easy stuff is how these three poets witness the world we move in, how they speak past the inherent institutionalized barriers that they continue to face as creatives, as scholars, as partners, as fathers, and as Black and Latinx men. Tonight is a reading, yes, but it's also community and proof that when one poet falls in love with and champions the work of another, Poetry turns from solo connection to conversation, to recognition, to witness. And now a bit about each of our panelists with a caveat. In a perfect world, these introductions would be so much longer. We'd include all of these poets publishing creds and believe me, there are many. And we would read passages from their work and offer personal reflections of how we admire and respect them. But tonight we're gonna keep this part short because each of these remarkable poets deserve as much time as possible to read and talk with each other. So please visit our website to read their full bios, find their social media information, and learn how you can read more of their work. Dr. Jose Angel Aragus is the author, most recently, of Rotura, published by Black Lawrence Press in 2022. He is an assistant professor at Suffolk University, where he serves as editor-in-chief of Salamander and is a faculty member at the Solstice MFA program in creative writing at LaSalle University. He blogs and reviews books at the Friday Influence. Quinton Collins is the author, most recently, of Claim Tickets for Stolen People, published by the Ohio State University Press, Mad Creek Books, 2022, which was selected by Marcus Jackson as winner of the journal's 2020 Charles B. Wheeler Prize. Quinton has been awarded a Pushcart Prize and the 2019 Atlantis Award from the Poets Billow. Quinton also tells the most dad, dad jokes. And Daniel B. Summerhill is the author, most recently, of Mausoleum of Flowers, published by Cabin Carey Press 2022. He is Assistant Professor of Poetry, Social Action, and Composition Studies at California State University, Monterey Bay, and has performed in over 30 states, the UK, and was invited by the US Embassy to guest lecture and perform in South Africa. Daniel is also the inaugural Poet Laureate of Monterey County. Please help us welcome Jose, Quentin, and Daniel. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. How y'all doing? Jose, Quentin, y'all feeling good? Yeah. I'm all yeah. right. I'm blurry. And I'm back. OK. <laughs> all right, y'all. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off. First of all, thanks to uh, to, to to both Lisa um, and Becca for for everything for making this happen for the 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 work leading up um, to to this event. Um, the organization, uh, the vision for Notebooks Collective is brilliant. Um, so shout out to y'all for making this happen. Um, 
I'm gonna jump in with with a couple of poems to to get us going. The first poem I'm gonna read is actually the first poem in the collection, Mostly in the Flowers. And it's called, Do Not Gather Flowers for Me. Yet, a black Cadillac first, a hundred. A Buick will do if old enough. It's all about the body and what it's born anyway. Line them up, out front. Then let the chrysanthemums, roses and carnations spill out each window. Make it magnificent. Rev the engines until they are voiceless, until there is no gas left in the cylinders, until a mushroom cloud of gray black exhaust can be seen from the heavens. Anything this large and dying must have God's attention. Um, and the second poem I'm gonna read, whenever I've been reading recently, I like to call in like a few folks to the, to the space, be it virtually or in person. And that's my grandfather, my daughter, my wife, um, and my nephew. And so this poem is about my grandfather who I'm kind of bringing with me to this space. It's called Sunday in Oakland. You ask about the weather outside in an attempt to stretch our visit. And for the next 22 minutes, flax and leaves smother the ground. The clouds are selfless and Oakland is golden today like all other days because Oakland measures its weather by the number of black bodies basking in the sun around Lake Merritt. By now, the most complicated thing you can remember of me is my name and how it forces your tongue to press against the roof of your mouth twice before the tension in your jaw is released. It is your only exercise. Routinely, you spend your time in bed until you don't. And then, like a moment at attention, the day is as grand as your body will allow. Oxfords, where the creases excavate themselves into a groove, a pork pie crown and a shirt that you ironed collar first, for the trip to refill your bag of chia seeds and other items your VA doctor recommended mostly aimed at preservation of a body that's broke in 43 during the swing of the Allies' fist. Your power chair hoists a flag that isn't red, white, and blue, but is as American as Jim Crow and you and what's left of the 92nd Infantry clasp onto your buffaloes as if they're the only thing you've claimed as your own. It's Sunday, and if there was a day of the week to sink into yourself, it would have to be the Lord's Day. No matter your position to God, you are no exception to this rule. You sit at the edge of a bed that is also half machine and ask me to turn the TV down. Before, in a swift motion, you bring your legs to rest on your mattress, your stiff landing, the last thing I hear from you, and your breathing slows almost still. Your nasal passages soften as if rehearsing how to leave gently. And I am reminded how some stars we admire don't exist anymore. How by the time we praise them, they've already shrapneled into God's palms. Oh, that was awesome, yeah. All right, all right, we're giving you like a little like a flight of po poetry right now, a little two from each one of us. Daniel, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my, my two tasters, uh, as they were, um, going to be reading only from my new book, uh, Rotura. And this first poem uh, is entitled Race. You cannot see the miles in the color of my skin, cannot see how fast the river runs and who can run as fast. Cannot hear how quick prayers are said, nor how swift to be forgotten. Headlights speed, speed of flashing lights, speed of feeling disoriented, no stars enough to recall the way, speed of having to turn back. Cannot know the work of generations gone, unknown, is done in what I do or don't. Speed of looking back, speed of passing signs, speed of names recalled, speed of stories told and told to forget. Another heart racing, set here to hurt, to laugh, to break. Heart set to this rhythm difference, this rhythm running, speed of the first breath, this breath, speed of the last. 
in the color of my skin, not a flush or flicker, no change, but who I keep becoming with each hurried, harried step. Thank y'all, thank y'all. And uh, this next poem um, was written November 22nd, 2016, and, and I didn't change it. I just kind of went with it. Uh, this, was as, this one's entitled uh, American Studies. My wife tells me of reading the Dear America books as a child, those stories told via the diaries of young women who lived during difficult times in American history. In these stories filled with suffering, were the facts behind the suffering? Her favorite involved the RMS Titanic, the unsinkable ship that sank. I asked if trying to imagine what it looked like, what was what captivated, and she says no, says only one book led to another until she realized she could never see it nor accept it. After the election, my friend explains he feels he could manage here, but not his children. He explains he spoke to their school director who comforted by talking about police presence. But if there's police, he asks, before anything happens, what will happen when something does? American algebra. Everything is X until proven Y. Dear America, if X represents what my friend feels thinking about the police, what language do you imagine he worries his children speaking publicly? And what language are we speaking now? Show your work. Another friend writes, here is a verse I think about a lot and maybe the mirror of the world will clear once again. She shares she has been sick since the election as I've been. I imagine our voices trying to commiserate between coughs. In physics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. What American physics happens here as I read and hear her voice behind the verse she sent? Are you, dear America, afraid as I am that our faces will no longer be there when the mirror clears? Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you both for, you know, heating it up for me and giving me you know, a tall task to open, you know, after that. Uh, but in all seriousness, thank you both for agreeing to this reading. Uh, you know, I emailed these two these two people and they said, yeah, we'll do it. You know, they could have said no, but they said yes. And thank you to Lisa and Becca for being so gracious to host. And I also emailed them and said, hey, can you host this? And they said yes, and they could have said no. And thank you to Patrick doing everything for Zoom behind the scenes. I know it's a big task. So I'm going to do a little... Uh, I guess Frankie Beverly, Joy and Pain. So we're gonna have one joy and we're gonna have one pain. So this first poem is called The Alchemy of Our Uncle's Chest Hair. It's from my most recent book, uh, Claim Tickets for Stolen People. <clears throat> that bounty curled from the convergence of shirt collar ornamented with Figaro. Sweat stagnates on the sternum, gilds the strands in sunlight. Our uncles offer a word with the Corona Budweiser or Heineken in hand at the barbecue. Chest strand snaked over the neck of a tank top reservoir for a stream of whiskey, tequila, cognac that misses their lips, rolls down their chins. If you let them narrate, like their myths of Jameson that transmutes into hair on our chest after the booze burns dull in our throats, they don't spill any liquor. Our uncles forget to mention this alchemy requires patience. They begin to manifest this magic in boyhood, days running the block with other boys until our grandmothers echoed their names from front stoops. That same echo prompts the gold glow. Summer afternoon sunlight slicked round loops of our uncles' chest hairs as they turn ribs on the grill. In their woven sandals, they weave their stories between beer sips shots and grown folks conversations. We listen to their silver tongue tales, how they persuade truth to stretch like hair fibers spread over their collars. Only when their hair silvers to Cuban links do we understand how liquor 
can orify our once bare bodies when we, before a mirror, notice a single strand spirals from our chest. So now we have a fun one. Um, this is what I wanted to read because I was like, oh, hey, you know, fellow millennials, we're doing a reading. So um, this is called Generation Snowflake. This is how they like us when we float down from the sky, when they can catch us in their palms, let the heat melt us to water, cold the concession to enjoy our presence they tolerate only if we leave our ice, if we lie on the pavement, do not obstruct their view, do not gather into banks on their roads, do not travel sideways. They like us predictable, light, malleable. If they can gather several of us packed together into a ball they can throw for fun, that's when they like us. Only when we powder their Christmas, when we do not blizzard or lake effect, do not accumulate more than an inch, do not grow into a bomb cyclone, do not rush upon them as an avalanche. They like when they can carve us with skis or snowboards, when they don't have to bend their backs to shovel us off their property. This is how they like us. Yeah, man. Yeah. Jeez, jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Um, so I guess we're gonna ask questions now. We're going to after the first, the first set of. Yeah, you happen with the first one. Happen with the first one, Mr. Summer. All right, cool. So, um. I listened to, so I did a panel this morning and Ian Haley Pollock was uh, the keynote. Um, so I'm privileged to hear that. And his keynote was uh, called the poetics or towards the poetics of the moment. And, um, and, and Quentin, I think you're familiar with this, Jose, you, you likely are too, uh, that Quentin is, I mean, not Quentin, um, that Ian is always kind of like pushing or nudging folks towards um, chronicling the moment and, and um, and of witness, of course, and what what we see in our communities, how we grew up, um, to kind of recall the things that that only our experiences can we can recall. Um, and so the question was kind of posed as, um, what is the value, or how can we we utilize poetics of the moment and have that actually transcend time, the same way that poems that are you know canonized also transcend time. So poems that are, you know, attached to place or attached to a particular social or political moment, right? Or poems that are, are very kind of granular and specific to a, a particular community. How can those poems hold as much weight um, as like a poem that, you know, somehow transcends time, right? And so when I heard Quentin, the first poem you did and then Jose, I think even both of your poems were kind of poems of, of the moment in, in, mm. in many ways. So I'm curious about your thoughts. I guess there's no question in this, but I'm, I'm just curious about like your thoughts about chronicling like, you know, your your immediate kind of, you know, um, perspective versus trying to attach like a, a more like, you know, long um, suffering kind of poetics perhaps. Yeah, no, I'll jump in. Um, I pre one, I appreciate you sharing that. And again, awesome, awesome reading, awesome poems. I'm really excited to be here. Um, but first and foremost, I think about, like your question makes me think about the, or, and your, everything you're saying makes me think about how much I fight against the idea of the universal. Like there's no universal. Like mm -hmm. we're all, we all have books that are in print, right? So somebody who can't see isn't able to, like vibe with our books unless we do audiobooks. But if sure. it's somebody who can't hear, like we, there's, there's so on a practical level, there's no universal. And on, on a thematic kind of level, it's really tough to like, so that you, I would even question the, um, this idea of like the divid, like we have to live by binaries. So there's the timeless poems that are canonized. And then there's yeah. poems of the moment. That's, an, that's a natural binary that's workable. And I think that's cool. But I always think about canons and I'm like, well, who's canon? Who, who's built that? If I try, I, as much as I love John Keats, like you, the footnotes for O2 a Grecian Urn that I have to give my students, like, okay, this is what Sylvan means. And this is why he's hanging out with an old Greek urn. Um, it's appropriation from, you know, it's all this stuff, right? So, so I feel like 
what if there's anything close to that 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 threads anything the work of us and the works of Keats and the words the work of Emily Dickinson it's this idea of connection the connection of ideas within ourselves like we're making something clear for ourselves each poet but also um, if we do our work right and it's clear enough for us then we can trust the reader to do the work for themselves in reading the poems and spending time with it so that they can pick up and connect with it as well. I think connection over universality is, is the key. And that that can be through something timely, so to speak. But it, also, it can also be about like nature, like each one of us would write about sycamore trees in different ways. So um, I'll stop there, yeah. Yeah, I think the, yeah, you, the, the idea of like the permission to be, you know, uh, in the moment. Right, this idea of writing towards universality, because um, I mean, realistically, the you know the only canon that I'm like really interested in at any point is like DJ Drama's like, you know, canon little little <laughs> sample that goes on his tracks, right? Because the thing is, like, we we make these things, right? We make these monoliths, and so, you know, there was a point where I was just like, man, like, YOLO is like ridiculous. Like, why, like, why are we like talking about YOLO going into the dictionary now when like it's like a meme now and it's gonna like exit the public consciousness in a few months. And I was just like, well, you know what? Ultimately, despite my feelings, right? Why can't we give permission to YOLO to be in the moment as those poems were when they were written, right? Because a lot of these poems too, like, you know, I mean, you have these people who criticize poetry now and say it's too political, it's too woke, but like, they don't realize like a lot of these poems were political through a metaphor that took it somewhere beyond its immediate situation. So I'm just like, well, okay, like why can't we say like all like all rap songs are gonna be timeless poems? Like, you know, if we have to read this many footnotes for Keats, why can't we read this many footnotes for future? Like it's I just don't understand like, you know, why there's that hang up on that kind of thing. And that's kind of what gives me the permission to say, like, hey, like ultimately like language is gonna evolve so much more, you know, a hundred years from now to the point where we might need footnotes on our poems. And I think the only thing that really can, I can say would, would bind anything is I think about the image, you know, and I think about mm -hmm. not just the image in terms of like how we're using it in the figurative sense, but like, hey, an apple, at least for now, an apple is still an apple, right? Um, when I did a panel with Stephen Cusisto for AWP, I think last year, um, he was essentially kind of talking back at uh, a question about like, as a blind poet, how do you do it? Like, how do you, and he said like nouns, like it's literally nouns, like that's how I do it. And so, you know, that the thing is like image, image is, 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 is there for all of us and the way in which we describe certain images, the language may change, but we all have image, right? And so um, I think the nature of whether or not our works or any works get accepted like that is really gonna come down to the thing that I've talked to you both about. You know, the idea that everyone has to want to Google for everyone's poems, not just the poems that they're told are worthwhile to be Googled when it comes down to what meaning means. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I'll just add to you're making me think I'm like Rap Genius, the website is way more entertaining and worthwhile than um, the Norton anthology, like those critical editions, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. those footnotes. I'm like, it, it, you get something like Rap Genius or any kind of a, like wiki around writing or around a fan art I'm like yeah like it's it's the option between becoming a scholar of something or becoming like in the in the traditional sense or becoming a scholar in a fun sense a fan someone you're you're excited about the work and you want to geek out about it so no oh, cool all right should I jump in with another poem yeah all right we're, good. we're doing the rounds now we doing this we doing this y'all all right, so I'll jump it off. Uh, who's after me, Jose or, or Quentin? Jose, cool, and then Jose will follow and Quentin will, will round us up. I'm gonna start us off with sitting in a workout chair against photo paper in open heat. There's a portrait of Huey Newton in my church. It's communion Sunday and mama has on her good shoes with the gold links. The Jackson boys are dressed to the nines. Their pants starch creased and hovering above their snakeskins like halos. Huey's in a black beret, but gone anyway. What's blood without a body to show for it? In the States, what is more righteous than a gun 
and a spear sitting at the left hand of God on a wicker chair in Oakland. Wicker chair out front since before COINTELPRO bludgeoned the Panthers. We've come because it's Easter and we're hungry. Inside, Marvin Gaye's falsetto seeps in like a gentle flood and the kitchen becomes a small soul train line for 12 minutes instead. All these bodies bending like prayer. Black means religion is second only to dancing. The day America stormed America, I was black and in exile for yanking a tulip from the ground. I shouldn't have, but wanted something more beautiful to die before I did. Call it civil disobedience. Damn, damn. No, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I more than like that. Just call that disobedience. That's going to stay with me. Um, so what we're doing, we're doing these little uh, rounds where we're each going to read a poem and we're, we're supposed to be inspired by the poem uh, before us um, from our books. And since you you spoke of um, Newton, I'm going to uh, I'm going to read the poem in my book about Selena, the singer um, from my hometown, Corpus Christi, Texas, and uh, whose death was also like this big, it's this big shadow, but it's like a funky shadow. It, it dances, it's cool, it cumbias. Uh, this poem is entitled Selena, a study of recurrence and worry. Somebody died and it's okay to be Mexican. No, really, this is good. I was worried nobody would understand what it means to come from a city named after the recurring body of a martyr. No, really, this is good. I worried a whole generation of young women from a city named for wounds and resurrection would suffer themselves to be stilled and lost. Now I worry a whole generation of friends close their fists around empty beer cans and walk out the door to become lost, distilled memories. You would think no one would sing here again, that with beer cans in their fists, mothers would tell stories about a ghost appearing should you sing here in this city, should you ever go on stage. A whole generation of mothers telling stories were not a ghost but a microphone vanishes directly below a spotlight that burns anyone who walks on stage, different moon in a different sky where it is always night. See. A whole city vanishes below the spotlight of my erratic memory. Corpus Christi, my imagination paints you as an indifferent sky where night after night we tell stories about who we were. You are more than my erratic memory and imagination, more than the name of a wounded returned body. When at night I tell stories about Selena, I know that it is more complicated than the name on a statue, more complicated than somebody died and it's okay to be Mexican. I know life is more complicated than anyone can understand or hope to become. Wow. Oh. I, I said I would be fine going last, but I'm starting to like regret that decision because I have like a little thing. So, but I think I'm gonna continue this thread of public figures. Um, significant public figures. So this book was actually one where I finally like years later had a reckoning with like what it meant that Barack Obama was like our first black president because that happened for the first time anyway when I was like 18 years old and really didn't have enough of a concept of the world of politics and a lot of things. Um, so I'm going to read this one called what I would ask about Barack's post-racial White House. <clears throat> What manner of gospel raised Barack Hussein Obama on Sunday mornings in the White House, muscle memory of mop bucket and vacuum on the Sabbath? Who awakened his hands? Smokey Norfolk, Yolanda Adams, Mary Mary. In this hand-me-down house, spine and rib frames behind the sheetrock, how often did Barack sleep late on a Saturday morning? Or did the voices never stop their whispers in his ears? I saw what he wrought upon his souls. I imagine the dead beneath the South Lawn could snare a root around his toes if he did not tread with caution. Am I asking too much of the mountain I raised for him? 
No, these questions are supposed to be for Barack. Not my illusion that on November 4th, 2008, we buried this country's history in Grant Park. We lowered it into the dirt through confetti on the grave, or so I thought. But these questions aren't for me. These questions are for a black man in a tan suit in charge of white America. Final question. Barack said Trayvon Martin could have been his son. In that moment, did he know he shouldered a cross that could drag him back down Golgotha? Well, it happened, but I stared at the hilltop and I haven't looked toward the ground since. All right, all right. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, because it's my turn to ask a question, um, and I will, but I'm wondering, what do y'all, uh, Daniel Q, what do y'all think? What, I, I'm still thinking about that poem. And I love that you brought in the, the tan suit. I've been thinking about that. So um, what do you think about switching up the rotation? Since I'm asking the question, then I will be the first to read in the next round, and then Quentin and then Daniel. So Daniel has the hard job. And then for our, <laughs> our final round, I'll, I'll have the hard job, because we got to I was just thinking yeah. about that, Jose. <laughs> so, so. I'm like, man. Same. All right. So my question is pretty simple. I've been thinking about this. I was thinking about this with our first uh, set of poems um, and just what the role of the body is for for y'all, what, what thoughts you have, because I'm, I feel like I'm a, a lot, a lot of my work, I think I got called out of, on this at one point from when I was getting feedback from, from a friend where it's like, you always disappear in your poems. I'm like, well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to like not be here which is weird for like somebody who teaches and who performs poems to like, to like wanna not be perceived, to be kind of um, weird about it. But, um, but I also, I'm sensing a, a lot of body in both of the, at least in the first set of poems that we all read. Um, and just, yeah, what thoughts you have on that tonight? Uh, whoever would like to go first. Do you think that your desire to not be perceived is our millennial urge? I hear that's oh, yeah. a thing we do. Oh yeah, that's that's totally it. <laughs> like it, it uh, amps think... up. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it amps up the '90s irony into like, no, we we were like totally nihilistic. Like I'm dead, literally dead. So <laughs> it's it's a metaphor, and it's not. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you know, I think that's an interesting thing because I was thinking in my head when we were reading our last round, I was like, huh, what's the like like where's our like individual line between like where the personal enters the political right because we all um to, to some extent do some kind of poems that would be you know called political right and like so like what's like what's our individual line of like where like the world is out there and then like we're inserting ourselves into it for perspective versus like the poem is just perspective about the world and we're not really part of it yeah. and I think it's just one of those things for me that's it's 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 interesting because like I don't know if I'm ever consciously thinking about it, but I I think one of the ways that I I at least am consciously trying to to do it is to make sure that like the the images I'm using are images only I would use if I don't insert myself into the poem of like you know the I exist in the middle of this poem about you know Barack Obama if it was never there like you know okay well what would eighteen year old me you know, me looking back on 18 year old me, how would I use images for that? Because I'm like, well, then what happens, I run into this like weird space of like, I can't just try and write poems or I'm completely detached in, in every manner because then like, I get the feedback that's just like, why are you keeping the reader at arm's length? And it's just like, yeah, why am I keeping myself at arm's length, right? And some of that's like, oh, hey, maybe I'm trying to keep myself out of this space because this is a space that's scary for me. So like, how can I push myself back into it for the level of introspection that's necessary for the poem so that it it feels like something and it doesn't just feel like, you know, an observation, you know, the idea of like what makes um, witness powerful is like, you know, the, you know, we have journalists who write down what happened, you know, so like, I'm taking, how do I take it past what happened? You know, why does it have to be a poem? And that's kind of the space where I'm like, all right, so this is where I come in, even if it's not an I, but this is where I will be there in the poem. 
Jeez. Yo, Jose, repeat the question. I want to be clear on like the actual question because Quentin made it to oh, yeah. me like a million different ways. I'm like, yo, wait, <laughs> what was the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love where I love where you went. The role of the body. And I think yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm the, at fault for kind of swaying it because I talked about disappearing. Um, yeah. And maybe that's something too, where I need to be more present in life. So yeah, the role of the body in your poems as you see it tonight, uh, 8, 10 p.m. Yeah, word. Um, so again, Quentin took me to like a few different places. And one of the things that I just thought about is how I kind of like believe that the, you know, poetry is a bodily art form. And so it's, it is extremely tough to detach yourself as much as you'd like to think you are from, from the actual poem because we, we're writing and language is our tool to communicate something that language derives from inside of our, our body. And like Quentin said, there's journalists that document the, the nuts and bolts of a thing. And that happens literally through like one of our senses, right? But if we can um, utilize the entire body, which includes all of our senses, even the senses that aren't usually named, then like that's when a poem becomes, comes to life, right? As opposed to a static thing that's, you know, um, that doesn't live anywhere outside of the page. And so, um, I don't know, it's tough for me to even to, to, to think about poetry removed from myself, even, even as I attempt to make it, uh, you know, more um, interpersonal. And um, the other word I was looking for is um, interior, right? Like mm -hmm. as much as I can try to do, to, you know, to detach myself from those things, uh, poetry is such a Bali art form that inherently it's going to happen, right? Otherwise, then like, how can you write a poem, right? Like, how how is it possible, you know? Um, that's my attempt to answer the question, to wrestle with the question. <laughs> Understand, oh, yeah. nothing I say is is like an answer. It's more so <laughs> me wrestling with the idea. <laughs> Well, what, what, I, what I'm loving too is like, yeah, like none of this is set in stone. That's why I'm like, it's it's what we think tonight, right? And the space we're kind of creating. Um, you're making me think of a couple of things. One, there's a, a, a quote from Federico Garcia Lorca that I read like when I was like 19 or 20 that like just stayed with me. And it's like, um, I think it's in the Duende essay, I'm not sure, but he talks about um, poetry. What is it? Books are where poems go to die that they're like mm -hmm. coffins, that the poem is only alive when I'm reciting it, when I'm performing it. And you were talking about like, well, yeah, poetry is a bodily art form. I'm like, well, yes, yes it is. In terms of it's ephemeral, like the body, the mm -hmm. body is not gonna be here forever. Like to go to pick on my question a little bit, like the body's not gonna be here forever. And mm -hmm. a lot of what people struggle with on the outside with poetry is like, like I wanna make sure I have it, that I can hold it, that I understand what the poem really means. and I. I whether it's my students or just people I meet, I'm just like, it's really about something else. It's, we can call it a vibe. You can call it about uh, a feeling or, or you know, you, you can feel it before you know it, right? Um, and so it's not static. Like if, if, if a poem gives you everything that it has in the, in the first reading of it, like you're not done um, is, is how I often, or at least that's the, where I hold myself. And a bit of, but, um, Quentin, what you were putting out there about going past what happened. Like if we think of literature and politics, the way I, I like to think of it is like, well, politics is about the crowd and you can get lost in the crowd. So the literature is about the individual and you get to, you, you get to ask that question, why am I going, how do I go past what happened? Past the facts. Because people can see numbers and statistics in news articles, but if you, get, if you hand them a poem or send them a clip of somebody on Button Poetry, talking about an issue via poem, um, they'll hear it differently. They might hear it like a little bit more um, organically uh, to go with what we're talking about here. Um, and that also lets me kind of think about poetry and some of the kind of like the, the aura around poetry that like, it always sounds like we're talking about thin air and I'm like, no, we're, it, or that we're just talking about feelings. And I'm like, we're not talking about feelings. I, was, I tell my students, I'm like, just because I'm a poet, I'm, I'm, a, gr I'm a grown man and I'm like, I'm a poet. <laughs> I'll say it with a serious face because I mean it, it's what I love. But um, it doesn't mean I have my feelings figured out. Like whatever society pop culture has about 
writers and poetry. I'm like, it's not that I have my feelings figured out. I still got to go to therapy. I still got to have those long talks in my relationships. And um, it's just that I'm able to handle feelings in aesthetic form. So I'm able to put on the asbestos gloves and kind of like handle things that, um, yeah, not everybody's going to want to go past what happened or go beyond what happened. But we do, the three of us, right? We're, we're kind of at that task. I hope. All right. <laughs> so I, so I, I spoke big and I said I was going to start this round. So unless y'all have more to say, no, it's all, we go it's on. All Keep it rolling. <laughs> Keep yeah. it rolling, all right. So I'm going to read a poem from my book called um, Certain Rivers. And um, it's based on, it, it's the, the last poem I wrote for this book and it's in the middle. I felt like the book was missing a, um, a kind of a centerpiece, uh, something in between the, the first and the last poem in the book. Um, and I built, uh, the title comes from this quote from Zesla Milosh, uh, when it hurts, we return to the banks of certain rivers. When it hurts, we return to the banks of certain rivers. I love this quote, and I believe the poem that it's from by Milos is called I Sleep a Lot. And I think if all three of us took the title I Sleep a Lot, we would write wholly different poems, but maybe we wouldn't say anything as heavy as when it hurts, we return to the banks of something or of certain rivers. So um, just love that. Um, so anyway, this is certain rivers. It's a bit of a sequence, so, so hang in there with me. When a river's crossed, how many families hold their breath? Breath made rivers they cannot keep inside, one after another, the only thought, adelante. Later, with children, with hours of work wearing down the body, these breath made rivers run through dreams and stories. They tell their children not to voice. Small faces hold still while questions begin to course and shadows dam the back of the throat. I have made a myth of our river. In telling the myth, one river becomes many rivers. The one my mother crossed lost in the one I cross now in ink. You can't step into the same river twice, but you can try. The sound will grow, will lap and splash. Sound of displacement, sound of will, of wanting in your mind, sound of steps going nowhere. Water knows how to be lost, has a need for it, just watch. The rain is all scramble and clearing of tracks. Watch a napkin over a puddle, how water goes for broke to be lost. Clings, rises, soaks the fabric, pretending part, like a dozen clouds that grow, give, and clear. Shadow is a kind of water in that it knows one way to be lost. Just wait, it says. Just wait. Water knows its way to truth. You can see what lies at the bottom of rivers. You can wash away the dirt to see your hands again. Water is then not the truth, but a way to it. Shadow then is not a lie, but something also passing over truth. Down the street at noon, you can look around without seeing others making the same strained face. A country also knows its way to truth, but can choose to pass over it. In this country of water and shadow, truth is strained from our faces. My mother turns to water on the phone. The river of her voice carries the years between us, years where I have strained to catch something of our changing faces. The river of her voice is a kind of truth I know. I see what lies at the bottom of those years. I wash away the dirt and see my hands tremble. Water knows how to be lost, has a need for it, but it cannot choose. A river runs to ocean and is not lost, just ocean. A river runs dry and is lost, you think, but later it returns, and only then do you ask, what is a river? But never answer, happy to have the river. People know how to be lost to others, crossing rivers helps. People no, but they must choose. And even then they are not lost to themselves. Mother, you brought me with you over water, over a way to truth, over the distance of your shadow and in shadows. Now we wait 
for the other to calm. Sometimes she calls in tears, and like an earthworm when the rain comes and fills its burrow, a part of me works itself out to the surface to breathe. I can hear the water in her words, flooding sentences of love and regret cloud what I know how to say. Whatever actual clouds in the distance between her and I rearrange as she continues to break and give herself over to the 10 or 15 minutes it takes to grieve that one cannot grieve. No hay tiempo. Tus hermanos, esta casa nunca está limpia. No ves? Cuida bien esa niña tuya, lo siento. No hablamos suficiente, deberíamos. Gente muere, sabes? I know. This voice from other nights, other cold moments when I've stopped in my life to listen, drummed out from the dirt of where I live and made to gleam like rain and worms, glass bottle shards, the hard face of a television clicked off to leave a house quiet, but for the pleading half whisper, half snore of a woman with no time to grieve. Like, it's nice. I always like need, like need this breath, like before I like even want to hop in, because like you, you like you're just trying to soak it in, like before you even like, yeah, wow. So, all right. So based on that, I think I'm going to read. Where is that poem? Here we go. I'm gonna read Exegesis on the Chicken Wing, because I like that you have that extended run with the river and talking about ancestry. So yeah, I'm gonna do this one. This is exegesis on a chicken wing. Pull apart the flesh between drumette, winget, rip and tear the meat with your teeth and fingers, cheeks greasy if you eat chicken wings the right way. From end to end, a linear timeline of fat gristle skin as you stretch the wing straight, the span from the ax to the chicken's neck, we expect no blood in the pan of wings from sharks, no reminder of sacrifice as an exercise of hands. Hunger is an exercise of protest. We quell the commotion in our bellies with mild sauce doused wings. With curved acrylics, my aunt excavates a vein in her teeth, sucks her canines to loosen the carnage. I eat chicken wings in my campus student center to consume familiar bones in public. Don't you dare leave all that meat on that bone. Suck the marrow, gnaw the gristle to pay respects to those who pluck feathers, cleave breasts from wings. It's Ramadan. At 3 a.m. my roommate fries wings to satisfy day long hunger. We leave a bowl of bones, grab a fistful. It's a register of ancestors hunched, elbows bent at 90 degrees, fingers pincered, around a chicken wing. Another bone clinks a plate. I unhinge connective tissue. Chicken bones scatter in a Walmart parking lot at the intersection of Ashland and Clybourne in Boston Common, another graveyard of hunger. If I gather these remains, I can chart a path home. Yeah, man. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite joints, too. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna pivot because, all right, I'm going to continue on the same kind of ancestry kind of theme uh, because the beginning of the poem I'm going to read kind of um, I think wrestles with, with the idea of lineage and ancestry. And also going back to Jose, the, the water reference with the river, I think has some connections with this joint. So I'm gonna read Mama, uh, which came after having um, a conversation with my mother in which she revealed that she had never experienced like sustained happiness and I liken sustained happiness to like joy. Um, and I think there's kind of a difference between the two. And so this, this poem was written after first being like really like 
heartbroken that she revealed that. And then secondly, trying to figure out like, what does it look like to live for six decades and to not remember like sustained um, happiness. So it's called Mama. Mama knows what it's like to hold and not be held. Mama Nancy, who is not my mama, but is the oldest mama I have a name for. In this way, history is young, not because it is young, but because it goes only as far back as our stories do. And I'd like to think memory counts for something. Three women separate her from my mama, each of them a comma. Each of them should have been a semicolon, but we know genealogy isn't forgiving that way. I'm the son of all four. And I am told by mama that her earliest recall of joy was being handed a quarter to buy a hamburger and still having 15 cents left over to buy penny candy. This girl, a woman, a mother, who has never been to the bottom of the earth and not that any long call flight will buy happiness, but being awakened by the unswallowed sun over the Southern ocean seems like a chief code for sustained joy. I say sustained in the sense that the sunrise is the only infinite rhythm I've seen. This isn't a poem about joy so much as it is a poem about dying without ever knowing it. But mama, you've always stricken me as someone who champions distance over death or faith over long suffering. In this way, I suppose joy isn't the antonym to pain, but the antibody. It is 1998 and you have just given me a pink food stamp enough to buy a zebra cake, Kool-Aid jammer and three packs of nanometers. The walk to the corner store, my faith, the slow skip back home, small joy. Here, my perception of, of small is grand enough to get me through the immensity of summer. How my mother summoned enough jubilance to share with me its blood. It is 2018 and I think of my trip to South Africa as a metaphor for food stamps. The flight, my faith, the flight, my joy. What I don't deserve, not considered here. The miles between me and the earth stretched faith, carrying me back home. I search out my window for land, but find nothing green, just blue. Plenty blue to fill small enough to remember my small mama with outstretched hands waiting for a quarter for joy. A girl, a woman, dear mama, your water will come and the sun will brass knuckle its way out of the ocean with enough triumph to make you feel golden. The ocean is the only constant here. It delivers us all. I'd imagine it'll deliver you too. If not you, your body. If not your joy, your pain. It will carry it in its mouth back to shore like a flood. So I think this is a great round of uh, poems to bring me to a, a question that I've been pondering myself a bit. Um, and I would love to hear your perspectives because it's pretty fresh for me. And it's when I talked about it a, a recent reading, but I, I'm still kind of puzzling through um, you know, the specifics of it. But so like thinking about like our cultural backgrounds, right? And you know what that means in terms of the ancestry of poems we, we create because of the people who come before us. Um, Jose, knowing about how you got your book title, for instance, you know, and like, you know, what you're calling to um, for that. And then, you know, again, the kind of conversations we have about, um, you know, the folks we look up to and admire from our, you know, from our cultural background. What do you both think about in terms of like how your culture serves as a form in your poetry, right? Like for me, I've always like noticed, like I have like so many poems about being black and it being summer, like, there's only like a few obviously in the, the two books I have, but I have like many more drafts that just, you know, never went anywhere because I was like, I can't keep writing about the same thing. But like the idea of like blackness in summer is like something I would love to like, just be like, all right, you know, workshop for black poets, like you this is your, this is your prompt. Your form is, is blackness in summer. Like that's your form and that's one of the, um, the aspects of it. So like, what do you both think about like that in terms from your individual perspectives, like how your culture creates formal like constraints within your work in a weird way. 
Ooh. You know, um, again, I'm going to attempt to answer this question in the best, <laughs> in the best way I can. And um, it's an interesting thing to think about, like how there's a poetics even to like our culture and identities and how that shows up even in things like form um, and our kind of, you know, small choices on the page and even like in readings and such. And I think, um, you know, things like, like rhythm and music, I think the same ways that like rhythm and music is echoed in like black culture um, comes through in the way that I decide to like break my lines or use a certain word over another word, right? To create that kind of sense of music. And um, I think that, you know, there's, there's an inherent kind of connection between culture identity and in the ways that our poems actually come out, right? Of course, like language is that tool, is that, is that, that vehicle between like the image and like the, the, the other end of the, of the line. And so, um, and of course, language is attached inherently to who we are, you know, in terms of identity and culture. So it's like, there's a continuum, you know, pipeline between those two things, between the way that I write things down on the page and my poet, my poetic choices, and also my mama and my grandma and my sisters and, and my uncle and my uncle deciding to wear whatever shoes while he's on the grill, right? And the certain way we season our foods, like all of those kinds of small cultural um, like items um, somehow inform the, the decisions that I make on the page. And I think a lot of it has to do with language and how language is often the vehicle between those, those two things, between the page and the culture, right? Language is that bridge. And so um, that's my attempt at answering that question. Thanks for it. Oh, yeah, no, that's a cool question. You got me, you got me thinking. I mean, if, what, what would be my two things? I'm brown and I'm sad. I'm brown. I'm brown and it's summer, uh, or I'm brown and I'm by water. I think <laughs> if I had to like split myself into that, no, nah, you made me think of a couple of different things. Um, one is uh, something that Norma Ikantu said. She's a um, uh, an elder in the uh, Latinx uh, poetry tradition, and she um, talks about, and she's from my neck of the woods, like South Texas, Mexico, Matamoros, that area. And so, um, what's it called? that we laugh through our tears she said once in an interview and I'm like yeah that's what we do like we and it, I know it's not just indicative to like Latinx culture but I feel like um marginalized folks we we do learn how to laugh through our tears because we have to like we can't stop and deal and unpack trauma a lot of the time because we're in survival mode right so there's there's something of that like there's there's gonna I always skirt with corniness I always skirt with sentimentality I remember at the the big NYU workshops and later in the PhD as well like uh, having to dodge claims or like like uh, people trying to call me melodramatic in my poems and I'm like is it melodramatic or can you not just hang like sometimes we need melodrama like <laughs> I'm sorry but like um, if if melodrama melodrama wasn't something that we we lived or we wouldn't have so many popular soap operas, telenovelas, Bridgerton, for crying out loud, like people love or, or put it in space, you know, put it in space. People want, like humanity is drama, the human experience is drama. Yeah. Um, so, so sadness, the, the elegy, I'm always talking about death for some reason. Um, and then like jokes, always these jokes too, um, corniness or grutsi as it's called. Um, I'll say two more things. One is um, there's this idea of rasquachismo. It's kind of like this aesthetic sensibility um, that I, I've been fascinated with for years um, because it gave me a name to understand myself in a way. Because in a lot of way, like what we're talking about is whether it's poems, poems are experiences. So the experience happens first or the poem happens first. And then we then comes understanding. Like we experience that that summer whether the, the good thing happens or a bad thing happens, we have the experience first. And then later we're like, oh, that made me really happy. Or later we're like, oh no, that really affected me. I need to unpack that. Um, and so with Rasquachismo, it, it, it's this kind of Chicano aesthetics form of making do with what you have, which is definitely um, tied to my, my poetics. Um, like I learned about syllabics before I learned that I was learning about syllabics. I was writing poems before I knew I was writing poems. It, it took a teacher to be like, hey, that, that looks like a thing, like a poem. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, 
So it doesn't always start in the classroom, this thing for us. Um, and I think that's that's where your poem takes me. It's like valuing the things that aren't taught to me in the classroom and bringing them back into a uh, conversation with um, with who we are. Like even as a professor, like the more I teach, uh, 14 years of teach, 15 years of teaching now, and I've only gotten more confident in my in my teaching, the more authentic I am, the more true to my authenticity I am. So like I've stopped wearing the button ups and the the elbow patches on the <laughs> blazers and all that. Like um, and just you know be myself, throw in a little Spanglish and uh, and so yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's there's the connection to language too, where Daniel, you ended your response, and so yeah, no, good question, thank you. Yeah, and I think it's you know it's it's an interesting phenomenon to think about, especially when asking you know other people, because like we know like we're not our cultures aren't monolithic, you know. At the same time, like, but there are these things where like sometimes I feel like it's it's an indescribable quality, um, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, Kevin Young has the Gray album, which essentially gives me like a roadmap of like, you know, how it's happening through black literature, you know, which is like such a fascinating thing. Cause I'm like, yeah, like I can't really like put my head, my, my head around like why I can read, you know, two black writers who have completely different aesthetics to their work. But like, I would, if you were to not tell me these are black writers, there'd be something indescribable that's in there. And then reading Kevin Young is like, okay, so maybe it's these little hints of things that I'm just not aware of that, you know, he took the time to name. Um, and I think in the spirit of both of your responses and the initial part for my question, I'm going to read something that's summer, that has a rhythmic quality, right? And that's also going to go back to a time of me trying to write toward when I was doing poem things before I knew what poems were. Um, so this is going to be a poem called Downtown Chicago, A Decadence Uncommon. And it's a poem about how when you grow up in the suburbs of Chicago, like it's a a, a big deal to get to hop on like the commuter rail and go into the city and hit the beaches. Um, and I was like, okay, if I'm gonna write like a praise to that, I have to kind of like write from like what I was like writing for poems at the time, which was a lot of rhythm, a lot of music because my first interest in poetry was slam and hip hop. So this is downtown Chicago, a decadence uncommon. Commuter train already eased into the station, almost ready to ease out, we sprint through the doors. Our heaves and huffs ease to laugh, just to cuddle through our teeth in full raucous as we pick up steam. As the train picks up steam, this cacophony we chorus on a summer Monday morning, while conductors click tickets, work weary nine to fivers, side eye our upper deck chatter, chatter we click. Jokes, favorite song lyrics, too loud for AM travelers, change we clink to pay our fares, change we say for a meal downtown. Downtown is where our skin learns new proximities. So close sweat beats skip from neck to neck, brow to brow, we arrive in the loop. Still loud as locomotives as we rack it off the train out of the station. Suburban kids bound for Gold Coast beaches. A decadence uncommon to our shopping mall, bowling alley, movie theater, roller rink routines, most days. Today we grip summer like sand, swimsuits under denim. City denizens for the day, Lake Michigan offers its tides to our feet, its gull sung serenade to our ears, fresh water up to our chest until the sun drops. Our eyes droop. We droop against train station columns, our gaggle no longer giggles. Just sweat heavy sleep as we wait for the next train to normalcy, as we wait for city lights to blur to black, train cars sprinting back to the suburbs. This is a tough one. This is a tough one, Quinn. Jeez. Um, okay. I'm going to read a poem called Territory. And um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Territory. I watch into the cosmos and feel infinitely small. How homies must feel when they watch the birth of a nation or any other carbon copy slave movie. And I'm always abundantly white. I can't help but think about the boys I grew up with who claim to run the city, not in colonial terms, but, but as anatomy. Learned since birth to measure land, not by geography, 
but through flesh and the taking of it. In this way, perhaps the obsession has always been the body and the destruction it's capable of wielding or falling victim to. In this way, they too seek something new, if not imaginative. If not through their hands, then through their bodies. In this way, we are huge after all. How the few feet separating our Nikes does nothing to render the entire sky between us. That's, that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. OK. This is stuff. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't want to. Quinn, read again. <laughs> Um, so in this, uh, no, in keeping with this, uh, thinking of like summer and like heat, um, I'm going to read a, another sequence. Um, I have a series of poems in this book called, um, con that start off with the word conditioning and they're different kind of studies on things. Um, and so I'm going to read conditioning air study, um, in which I, I try to be clever while also trying to say something about, you know, Laughing through our tears? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, this is called Conditioning Air Study. Conditioning is what is done with soldiers, the heads of children and dogs, what is studied in the swipe and tap of our fingers across screens. Conditioning is your legs red at noon, the concrete of a city blurred by the same fever, falling in sheets of sweat down your back, your head ringing, swimming in light. Conditioning is the hubris of weather by button, the shift of belt buckle mentality of, it don't matter even the holes in the sky or the waste in the water, we can fix this, fight the sun's mad knuckle. Your tia hates it when you block the fan while she watches TV. Anytime you do, a sandal shoots past your head and smacks the glass like a fish flopped on concrete that sad sound of being out of place. You are used to it, used to sunflower seed shells popped between teeth, counting down each salty second, used to the shells collecting in the trash like the black and white wings of some creature that has to be gnashed at for the summer to pass. Walking down the hall and feeling the cold seep through the cracks of other people's places activates thoughts of faces working outside when the sun's gold skin raw forgets to how to hold back. Thoughts of another life where you walk down streets until your shoelaces were bit away to the knot and nights where you held a small fold of dollars like aces, allowing you to sit a little longer, hold a coffee in a diner a little longer when it got too bad outside. Thoughts of how it's always bad, even when it's not your hand anymore or your back, just your impoverished pride walking beside you, feeling the cold like a voice rising in another room, shutting you down to a whisper in the margins of someone else's argument. Down the aisle of a bus with a broken AC, a boy follows his mother, his whole body shoved forward by the clamber and shuck of a stop. His open palm hits his mother's waist. She swats it, switches her cell phone to the ear closest to him. Without looking up, the boy tries again. His fingers in the air, he'd have hold him, spread, let through light. All right, Daniel, you're back. We got you. Hey, can you guys see me in here? Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. Perfect. So I think we're now to the portion for audience inquiries. <laughs> I, this is Becca. I haven't gotten any questions from folks um, over chat. However, um, we are a smaller group. So if anyone wants to chime in now and like unmute yourself and ask a question that's totally cool with us um otherwise we've got about 15 minutes late and left and it might be nice to have us close out uh have everyone close out with one poem to to end the night um All but right. well, two, what 
two things while well, people are kind of you know summoning the nerve to maybe ask mm -hmm. a question one audience you had one job you had one job <laughs> we read poems and came up with questions for each other so i'm just saying i'm just saying no 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 i'm just lying i'm just lying uh two i just want to geek out real quick and say um uh i'm always mad when i hear your chicken wing poem man i wish i'd written it like because i always think about i can't eat a chicken wing now without thinking about that poem and it makes me think like um of just how many associations i have with it if, all the way back like i mean uh, like i was saying earlier like experience before understanding so i had to eat the chicken wing before i understood how wonderful it was and apologies to to our, our vegan friends there um but um but even back to like, I remember watching How to Be a Player with Bill Bellamy back in the day. Maybe I'm dating myself there. It's a 90s movie, yeah. but like, yeah. there's a there's a scene too where the where a guy's like eating a chicken wing, and another person's like, "Hey, hey, just calm down. Like, you know, if if you there's no more meat left, like, what are you doing? Like, if an archaeologist finds this bone, they're gonna think you and the chicken were involved somehow." And I was just like, even then, that joke just like was the funniest thing. I was like, maybe. 10 at the time when that movie came out but i was just like oh my god that's so funny because food brings so much pleasure you know uh, all right y'all yeah. i bought some time for y'all so if you got questions <laughs> <laughs> well while we're waiting i'll just quickly respond to that to that and say the first one i wrote in my first book was in response to a co-worker saying um how can we eat chicken wings at like for lunch at work? Like they're just so messy. And I was just like, but like they're good. <laughs> like, does right. it matter? <laughs> like, do, do you understand? You know, like <laughs> they give you wet wipes, so, like they give you a little <laughs> moist toilet. It's like, come on. Yeah. I know that I just got a, a, a question from Chris uh for for Quentin. Um and he said, Chris, do you want to ask your own question? It's totally cool if you want to unmute and ask your own question. Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Okay, cool. Because it said I needed permission. Uh, you you mentioned earlier that like when you were writing the poem about oh, like the Obama election, you had to go to like the stylistic or the mindset of you at the time. When did you come to that realization? Ooh, <laughs> was that was that? I don't know if that was early draft, but. I think it was kind of like, uh, so this, this book was very much a, a planned thing in, in the sense of like, I had topics and I was like, I'm going to write poems for these topics. And so with that amount of planning, a lot goes right and a lot goes wrong. Um, the right is you write a lot of poems quickly, but the wrong is that you have a lot of first drafts that are based around a subject, but they don't really have their, their idea which I, I would say, you know, somewhat of different things. And so it, it, it kind of hits the point of like, okay, I've written a draft that says something and that something being, I want to interrogate the fact that I'm just not realizing, because that was actually probably the poem that's like, I'm, I'm just not realizing how much it mattered that Barack Obama was president, you know? Um, okay, so like, how do I make that poem interesting beyond the observation that we had a black president because there's a lot of those you know there's a lot of barack obama was you know our first black president poems and i mean i just think about my parents right my parents have the, a picture of the of them that night you know sitting in, in in the family room so like the the nature of that in our culture was pretty ubiquitous that everyone was very proud of this moment so how do i make it real for myself which is like okay, first I have to think about like, what is, what was my perspective on this? And then two, like, yeah, like, how do I make this um, one of my poems, which is, I was 18 at the time, you know, um, how do I reach back at being 18? And then just how do I reach back at my younger self? So one of the ideas being that reference to the idea, like on Sundays, you know, for a lot of, you know, a lot of people, we have this idea of like, Sundays were days that were meant for cleaning. And in a lot of households, that was gospel music that was playing. So you knew if it was gospel music on wow. Sunday, you better be ready to clean, right? So like, how can I reach an image that can also take me back to a younger space? Um, and that's the place where like, okay, I've written the feeling. The feeling has been written down. Now I have to mold the feeling with like intentionality. 
And um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I can't say which draft specifically. It might have been the first. Maybe I like, I, I, I got it on the first go, but um, it was definitely getting to that point of thinking, like, how do I make this not another like we had a black president poem, and that would be the place where the stylistics come in. Yeah, you keep talking about drafts. I I didn't think you drafted. I thought you were like Jay Z or Lil Wayne, just like off the top, <laughs> off the dome, like first first draft, best draft. Like it just came out that way. I woke up like this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like. It. I, I know that question was just for two. I think what am I think? I, I would say too. Like I would compare it to something. What you're what you're describing. What that question makes me think of too is like, um, like the difference between. It's like when you write a Crassus poem, and for people who don't know what an Crassus, a Crassus poem is, it's a poem about a painting. It's a fancy word for just you're writing about a painting. And there's always that point where you're describing the painting, and then like that's not you're not done. Like all you do is describe the painting. You've kind of just you know written a nice kind of catalog blur. But a good a Crassus poem or a moving that's get good and bad out of it. A, a a crassus poem that moves us and the same thing with a, a political poem quote unquote because they're all political but like a poem that moves us takes us beyond the inspiring and the inspiration and goes deeper into those levels and it does take that kind of crisis of uh, conscience it, it takes that kind of uh, the work on the self to kind of um, to get to get to that place so and that's evident in both y'all's work um that y'all are doing the work to kind of to give us poems to give to go deep into your kind of feelings and your your minds and come back with these poems that uh give light to us so thank y'all i'm gonna hop in real quick and just do a time check and say that i think what would be super cool and awesome is if y'all could eat, all read one close out poem um and then we have just a little conclusion to go through, um, but I want, um, I would love to hear some more. If that works for everyone, that would work. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Yeah. So, um, who's gonna Who's gonna start us off? Daniel? Yeah, Daniel's up, up first again. I'll go, I'll, okay, here's what I'll do. Speaking of political poems, I've been told this poem is a political poem. <laughs> Although I agree with you, Jose, that all poems are political, right? Uh, this is called Footnotes for Kanye, and it's after Jasmine Mans. One, the first time I heard Pray for Kanye was at a Black Lives Matter rally. Not that prayer is antithetical, but prayer next to anti-Blackness is a flood, not a life draft. Two, as if there isn't a grandmother's last breath interceding for even the most defiant among us. Three, there is something to be said about dying before death, how suffrage isn't always the antecedent, how some of us find glory in drowning. Four, politics have taught me your desires, yay, no matter how deviant, don't outweigh your means, and for that, I am afraid. Five, I asked my mama about a world without the woman who birthed her whole at Wauwatosa, she smiles and asks me to pass her the salt. Six, I'm afraid because any day without a mother's smile is no day at all. Seven, because if not God, my mama. Eight, if not a life raft, a flood. Nine, I'm afraid because you ain't talked to God in so long. Ten, yay, are you more brave than free or more ignorant than a housefly missing the door? 11, do you miss the door? 12, when I listen to no church in the wild, your voice is both the mob and the non-believer. 13, are you still famous in your hood? 14, because these kids still want to be you. They want to rap and make soul beats just like you, even though you just not you. 15, tell me, now, where's the South Side? Wow, that, 
the way you flip the disbeliever or the non-believer line. Yeah. I used to play this new. I agree, Chris. I'm agree. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> call the man out. Um, but in like a, a love way, yeah. Um, hmm. I am, I, I struggle between two poems to read. And you know what? I'm going to read this one. And y'all don't know which one I'm not reading, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> this poem is called Coconut. I hurled one to the sky and hoped, let it drop and hit the sidewalk. Did it again, did it until it split a cloud stream trickling from coarse brown skin. This, when young, and my tia yelled, enseñame que macho eres, and ran me out with the rough, hairy rock. I knew I couldn't return until I wrecked away inside. Brown faces hurled hard words at me. Coconut rolled into pocho, which cracked into, ¿Quién crees que eres? Something I keep asking myself, tasking myself to answer, and certain I can't. Mandilon followed my first marriage, whispered by a couple watching me, way through bras with my then wife, a white woman who said I should man up when I translated this new label to her. ¿Quién soy? I am the quiet tears trickling down my coarse brown skin. I am a wrecked way, way, way inside. I am a question asking itself, myself, whispered by those watching me. Again, thank you both for, you know, humbling me with reading with me for our new books. Thank you again to Becca, Lisa, and to Patrick. And because I'm reading among some of my dearest friends, I'm going to read a final poem with some bad words in it, because that's what you do when you read with your friends. So this is a poem called uh, My Catch My Niggas. And um, I think I wrote it after reading um, or hearing or thinking back on a Nate Marshall poem. And I was like, all right, I have to write my ode to a word that I don't necessarily really find much use for in my life, but I understand and, and admire its cultural significance. So this is uh, my catch my niggas. My catch me and my niggas knotted in the dirt. My niggas all fists and elbows and grapples and just a bunch of boys. Might not say yo mama again. Might not catch me saying nigga in front of my mama. Might catch my grandma saying nigga in front of me. Might catch my niggas chest puff. Might catch a brick on your forehead. Four fingers and a thumb might paint your eye black. Five fingers might snatch a discount. My niggas might catch a football. Might catch the beat. My niggas might beef, might not be my niggas for long. My niggas might mend. Might mend some shit to gold. Might change a dollar to a dream. You feel me, my nigga? My nigga, you good? Might harbor some angst. Might gutter healing in nigga. Like a reservoir catches rainwater. Might catch runoff, my nigga. Might run off, my nigga. Yeah, might run until they can't catch me. Cops might snatch another black body with the sidewalk. Might catch pavement in my teeth. The whole city might catch the smoke. Might catch that brick through a window. My mouth is glass and cinder and America might snatch my neck on live TV. My life might change to a hashtag. Might catch a bullet before I catch a break, my nigga. Might catch a bullet if we run. Might catch a bullet if we don't. Might catch us before the grave. Wow. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Jose. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, I'm afraid that when we watch the recording of this, it's just gonna be a lot of me going, wow. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's deserved though. I mean, wow, man, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, much love to, to, to all of you all. Uh, Jose, Quentin, again, pleasure to read with you both. Um, hopefully many more times in the future. 
being able to hear like like folks that I admire in the same space is always like electrifying for me and like um, rejuvenating in, in a lot of ways when like oftentimes I feel detached from like the poetic community. And so being able to like be, you know, in the same space as y'all is always a, is a pleasure. So much love. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, I don't want this to end, but it's time to end. So I want to thank everyone so very much for coming. If you would like to unmute yourself, and give our poets a huge round of applause. I think everybody would love that right now. So I'm gonna take a second to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Woo. There's Meg. <laughs> There's Meg. Love okay. it, y'all. Thank you. Um, a couple of, of small things, um, but big things. Don't forget to support Daniel, Jose, and Quentin directly by following them and buying their books, please. We are placing the links to those books in the chat so that they're easy to access. You can also go to our website. There's a bookshop.org link with uh, links that you can purchase there. Um, and if all else fails, e email one of us and we'll send you links because everybody should have these books. Um, also, please follow the Notebooks Collective on our social media accounts. And if you haven't already, please sign up for our newsletter. Those links are also in the chat. We have some fantastic programs coming up and we want everyone to know about them. And with that, I want to say thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you all again soon. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye. Thank you.